Good morning, everybody. I'm Jim Lauterbach. I am the GM of VidCon, which is the world's largest celebration of online video for the industry, for business, for fans, for creators in the US, in Abu Dhabi, in Mexico, and through the work of and the help of Jasper and the branded team, we are bringing it to Singapore. We already did our summit last year. I think you'll see more of it coming up later, maybe this year, and then definitely next year. So I got a treat <laughs> for you today. I have the uh, guy who started VidCon, Hank Green is here. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about the future of online video, the past of online video, and what's going on right now. So Hank, join me up on stage. Hello. So Hank Green, um, I want you to talk a little bit about where you came from and how you got into online video. But I want to start it by saying Hank is, Hank is a traditional OG online video star. It was there in the early days of online video. And unlike many of them, he's actually still relevant. Um, so Hank, how'd you get started with online video? Uh, well, uh, it was 2006 when my brother started first watching some of the early, early stuff that was happening, even before people were uploading to YouTube. And like to the point where when we uploaded our first videos, we weren't sure if we were going to use YouTube. Um, but we started in 2000, like January 1st, 2007, we decided we were going to do a project very much like what Zay Frank had done, where we uploaded a video every day for a year. And after that year was up, uh, we had built a pretty substantial audience. And also, we were starting to see ways that we this like might be a thing that we could make money doing and have it be at least a portion of our careers. So we just kept on doing it. And uh, that and, and basically, and then today happened. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting, the format that you developed, because uh, you were living in one part of the country, your brother was in another mm -hmm. part in the US. And yep. rather than having a conversation back and forth on email or phone or whatever, what brothers typically do, you had this conversation ongoing with your brother in public online. Yeah. And it was fascinating and 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 informative. And, and the two of you are, are incredibly wonderful and, and complex human beings, uh, super uh -huh. smart, super polyglot. And you built this great audience of people. They started branding themselves, I guess, right? Or you called them the the nerd yeah. fighters. Talk about how you built yeah. that audience and what that was like. Well, I think a big part of it is that John and I were making videos to each other and like the people were sort of just like the secondary audience. So they got to witness. So like the most important words of every video were like, good morning, John, or good morning, Hank. So people knew that there that this this video was part of a larger project and that they were sort of like snooping in on this thing. It also was a thing that actually did allow us to get to know each other better as adults because we really didn't know each other very well when we started doing it. Didn't have like reasons to talk very often as is the case often with adult siblings. And, uh, but, but we had always like had this kind of competitive relationship and that competition where we're like trying to one up each other in terms of the quality of our video or how funny something is or how hard we worked on it. I think really pushed us forward in those first those first months and maybe years when there weren't that many people watching. But um, being able to build this audience and really begin to include them in it, and that's the thing that's different about online video, uh, at least initially, was that there was, because I was making a video on Tuesday and seeing the reaction to it on Tuesday and like can adjust and make another video on Wednesday that reacts to what happened, in the comments of that video, it makes people feel like they're a part of the thing in a way that they can never feel like in traditional media. Yeah, that was the thing that I found so amazing in the early days of YouTube, and you guys captured this so well, which is, you know, we didn't know if it was just gonna be television delivered digitally, which is some of the early stuff that I ended up doing, mm -hmm. or if it was yeah. something brand new and different. And in many yep. ways, you brought the audience in this community together in a way that you could not do with the megaphone of traditional media, and it wasn't just you and your brother having a conversation. It was hundreds, then thousands, then tens of thousands, then millions of people all having what felt like a mm -hmm. conversation together. Yeah, yeah, and it, it works best actually when it's a smaller group of people. Like now with you know hundreds of thousands of people on every video, mm -hmm. it's, it's harder to feel like a really core community. 
Um, and so I, I'm really enjoying witnessing those smaller communities form on other platforms uh, a, a, over the last you know 15 years of this. But it's still happening. You know, it, it's re like Twitch is very effective at that. TikTok is very effective at that. And you get to feel like you're, you know, a part of something where you are a piece of it that matters. So, and in the early days, a lot of it uh, seemed to have been built around Harry Potter fandom. Is that is that legit, yeah. you think? <laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I, like, we were making content right when the last Harry Potter book was coming out. And I think those people were sort of searching for, like, what their next thing would be. Um, and, you know, obviously there was plenty of movies and theme parks yet to come in that world. But um for uh for their like hardcore fan stuff and like i was a huge harry potter fan so i i, I was talking a lot about it and, and i think that a lot of that community which was really robust and they had conventions and they had you know websites that were really focused on uh, on that fandom like we got to interface with that in a way that was like and also really formative for the community because the people who came in through that fandom really informed like what we felt like we were doing. And Harry Potter fans are a certain kind of person. They're very inclusive. They're very open. They're, they're not about like guarding the fandom against people who are fake fans in general. They're about like trying to share it and be excited about it. So that got to be a thing that we just embodied. And I think in the early days, we were just sort of very, kind of a little bit clueless about how all this was working functionally and, and but feeling very good about it the whole time which was really nice. And I still feel good about it because uh, those, those people are, that, that fandom is great and has you know, done a lot of amazing things. Yeah, and then, so let's move on. You talked a little bit about cons. You started a thing called VidCon in 2010. And uh, mm -hmm. I will say, I, I'm a Harry Potter fan. I read all the books mm -hmm. and not at the level of fandom probably of a lot of the folks that you know, but I will say being at the first VidCon, I think it was the first VidCon, I still remember being so moved by one of the performers did a song about, I think, being a Gryffindor in love with a Slytherin or something like that. But it was yeah. just such a great song. And it, it was <laughs> it was a great love song. And because I knew mm -hmm. the context, it was actually a very fascinating. I felt like I was part of an inside thing. But yeah, tell yeah, me where you, you that sort of VidCon <laughs> came from and how you built it and how you tend to think it differentiated it from some of the, you know, whether it was LeakyCon or some of the other Harry Potter conventions and other yeah. geeky out there yeah I mean that that was how we started is I'd been to some Harry Potter conventions and I talked to the woman who was running them and I was like hey Melissa do you want to like what do you think of a YouTube con and she was over the moon at the idea and immediately started helping me do it and, and that's like that's basically why VidCon happened because Melissa and Ellie was so gung-ho about the idea um, and but but I knew that it wasn't going to be like a Harry Potter convention because like in a sense you know, at, at a Harry Potter convention, you're celebrating the thing and the thing is it like exists, but like it's it's confined and it is one thing, whereas online video is going to be an industry. And I knew it was going to be an industry. I knew it was going to be on, you know, maybe not on the same level as um, like gaming, but a, you know, a similar like like a structurally similar to that, if not on the, on the exact same scale, though, maybe it is actually it turns out to have been on the same scale. Um, and, and and so I was looking at other conventions like that, like Penny Arcade Expo, um, that that were focused on creation. So the people who are making the thing, but also the industry around the thing, but also the fans and loving of the thing, and bringing those things all together in the same place has a kind of energy that you don't get when it's just one or the other or the other. And you need, because you need the creators to be seeing the fans, but also to be having the reason to be there of the industry. And you also need to see the people who are selling the ads, who are in charge of the platforms to see the real life impact that they're having on these people through these platforms. Like, I think that we miss that a lot of the times in this industry. It's so big that you can't get your mind around how big it is until you're actually in the room, even if it's just 5,000 people, you know? Like, that, like 5,000 people on a view counter doesn't seem like very many, but 5,000 people in a room and you're like, oh, this is real and big and it matters. Yeah, so that the, you, had, you showed a prop before that, which was the uh, guide from the first yeah. VidCon. I was just trying to find mine, <laughs> it's up there somewhere. Uh, I have a lot of the uh, more recent ones. That was the first VidCon guide. And not it big. Was, yeah, not big. It was 1,400 people in uh, Century City in the basement of the Hyatt. 
Third year mm -hmm. I grew to, to um, the convention center in Anaheim and went global in 2017. I think the one thing mm -hmm. that you did that was brilliant uh, was as you started to have a convention for fans, you started to embrace the industry. We all started coming and they were like, we should do industry content. Uh, and then added in a third track to focus on creators to help people become the next generation of creators. But the idea mm -hmm. that unlike going to uh, another con where it may just be all about the fans, you actually pulled all the constituents of the community together as you were talking about. And that to me is still a unique thing about VidCon that I haven't seen many other places. And it is a place where you can have a weighty conversation about the future of media. And then you walk out of that room and you see a bunch of teens who are all gaga over the fact that one of their favorite creators yeah. was just on stage yeah. and that they're, they're basically uh -huh. palpitating or they're over in the corner yeah. making a TikTok. Right. And you can also like there's occasionally like uh, you see like in the back of an industry session that there's like a group of six like super fans that got the industry ticket so that they could come and see their favorite, you know, Internet creator talk about the business. Like, do they want to just be there in the same room with them or are they actually interested in it? Or did they think they just wanted to be there to be in the same room with them, but then actually find that it's useful and powerful to have a better idea of how this all actually functions? I like to think it's that one. Yeah, I, I think that like I think it's hard to pull off, but in online video, it's easier because I think there is more bleed between those things. So you have people who are creator, like every creator is also a fan. So I, I'm at VidCon and I'm always seeing people that I'm like over the moon to see for the first time in the real world and be like, oh my God, you're real. I'm such a big fan. And also like you have like almost everybody who's there as a fan has some bit of them that wants to be a creator and wants to engage on that level. And I love to see that transition from somebody who came as a fan and then came as a creator and now is coming as either a featured creator or an industry person, you know, and that transition sometimes only takes three years. Sometimes, but sometimes it's taken 10 years where we have people who came as fans the first year and, you know, now are in the industry, you know, maybe not even in front of the camera, but like helping enable all of this stuff to work. Um, so I think it's, I think it's really powerful, I, but I, I think it, it makes a lot of sense for this industry because those lines aren't as clear cut. Exactly. And even the, on the industry side itself, when you see the people that come for the industry track, most of them are creators as well at one level or another, <laughs> even if it's mm -hmm, just, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they've got 50 followers, but they're focused on making sure they're doing the best stuff for those 50 followers. One of the yeah. things that over the past 10 years since you launched VidCon that you've, we've all seen is sort of the rise of this creator class, a rise of people mm -hmm. that are making a living as a creator, uh, not in traditional media, no gatekeepers, nobody's giving mm -hmm. them anything. They're building their, their, plan, their, their, their channels and their audiences directly. But we've also seen the rise of um, a sort of a, a darker side of that, which are kind of the, the influencers. And I, I don't know if there's a clear line between creators and influencers in okay. your mind, but the Kim Kardashians <laughs> or the, the people oh, okay. who are begging for free hotel rooms, how do you see that mm -hmm. evolving and how do you see the creator versus influencer marketplaces either coming together or diverging? Uh, that's interesting. It's hard for me to actually draw that line in a clear way. Um, you know, to me, an influencer is just a creator that's being thought of by a marketer. It's like, this is how, like, marketers view creators as influencers because that like for a creator my job is to make content but when a marketer is looking at me they're like my job like the thing that i'm useful for is my influence and mm -hmm. so i don't i don't so in general when a creator starts to refer to themselves as an influencer that does kind of give me the wibblies usually the wibblies it does kind of make me feel a little uh iffy um, you know, but usually that's just because this word has kind of taken hold as like, that's what this job is. You know, I, I think certainly that there are lots of ways in which being like having this job can be bad. It can be bad for people and like for the creator themselves, um, because it's just, it's just a whole lot of pressure. And also it's, you know, there's not a lot of structure. And so it's pretty common for there to be some situations where people get, you know, taken advantage of. Um, and also, I, I think that, you know, we, we sometimes people don't know their limits um, and push themselves too hard. I, I also think that it can really chew people up and spit them out, you know, like you come in and the, 
it's it's going really well, but then like one thing or the other changes, whether that's internal or external, and and suddenly like you know this thing that was really filling you up goes away, and you have to find a new way to define your your value in the world. You know, I talk to a lot of people like that, try and and you know like realize that of course their value was never in the fact that they had a big internet audience; it was other places. Um, and, but there's also, I think there's also darkness in terms of like, um, because now it is such a desirable job, a lot of people will do a lot of stuff to get it and, uh, or even to pretend to it, to pretend like they have this job. And, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's been really disillusioning for me as a person who was doing it back before it even was a job, but it, you know, I think that it's something to 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 watch out for be wary of you know i think and i think a lot of times people are manipulating they, they're manip like marketers are manipulating creators creators are ma manipulating marketers um and so i think that like we it, it it falls on all of us the responsibility to like be straight with each other but also be wary that we might not be being straight with each other well and i think it's also the fact that we now have multiple platforms that people can be creative on it you know, when you started, when VidCon started back in 2010, 2011, 2012, oh, yeah. it was YouTube and that was it. And mm -hmm. now we've seen the rise of a number of other platforms, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, um, you know, Tencent, Baidu, all, all around the world. How do you think mm -hmm. that proliferation of platforms that have different sort of senses of what you create, how you create, how people consume, how has that either made it easier or more difficult for this creator class? Oh, I mean, it's it's made it it's made it that's interesting. It's done, it's done both, but it's done it in a way that's diversified it. So me, I am too busy for the most part to take on a new platform. Though TikTok has been an exception over the last few months, and uh, and so in general, and this is generally true of people who already have audiences. When a new platform arises, we just don't have the the energy or the free time to, to take it on and be like, I'm gonna be a Twitch star now. Like, you know, it, it probably the barrier for us would be lower, but it's still too high because we have too much other stuff going on. And, and that means that every time one of these new platforms starts happening, and I think one of the reasons why new platforms get successful is because it creates this space for new creative people to be creative in new ways. And, and if I just sort of jump on and I'm like, I'm going to like upload my YouTube video to TikTok, like it's not going to work, right? Because the platform is different. It's culturally different. The, you know, it's, it's also functionally different. So, I, you know, I, I think that it means um, a little bit that like the, the individual creator who's trying to like maintain a career over a long period of time, it might be make that harder, might make that process harder. But overall, I think it, it makes the ecosystem much more diverse, far more kinds of people getting to create, um, far more kinds of content getting created, far more audiences being served. And you really see that on TikTok. And this is actually seems to be a trajectory to me where every new platform that comes up creates more space. And that's one of the competitive advantages that they have against, you know, a, a more, you know, entrenched player like YouTube is that it creates more space for more kinds of content and for more kinds of people to reach more kinds of audience. And that's that's exciting. I think it it, it you know it, it might be really hard for those people on those new platforms to figure out at least initially how to make a living doing it, how to make money at all. But it it does open up the the doors to being a creator to more and more and more people. And I think if we just had you know a couple platforms that that sort of owned it and stayed in ownership of it, that would not be the case. You um you brought up TikTok, and I know you're spending some time on TikTok, creating video, building a community, <laughs> thinking about whether you're actually ever going to get paid on TikTok. What do you think of TikTok? Tell me what what you think about it. So for context, both of us are in the United States, and um, yeah. we happen to have a, an interesting situation going on with TikTok right now. But what do you think of it as a platform for creativity? Um, it's it is a it is a platform for creativity. It's not uh, necessarily a platform for uh, building a sustainable career. Uh, I, obviously, some people can do that. I th just think that the threshold is very high. When it so, like, I think that it's easy to have a million followers on TikTok and and not have any way to make money. Now, that's also the same on 
Twitter. Like I, you can have a million followers on Twitter and nobody says like, are you making any money doing that? Like, no, nobody thinks you are or would expect that you would be. But, um, but now, you know, I have, you know, en enough followers on, tw on TikTok that like I'm making like $500 a month, which is like not a, like a thing that matters to me. But if like, if I know that like somebody at my level on TikTok, of which there are maybe thousands at least, is making $500 a month, that's a big deal. And this is all through the TikTok Creator Fund, which is a really interesting idea, I think. I think it was really smart, really savvy, um, and, uh, and something that I think a lot of TikTok creators are actually being a little quiet about right now because of the fact that they're taking home money that really matters to them. And uh, so, so what do I think of it though? I think overall, what it feels like to me is it like that the killer, you know, like obviously the algorithm is like the main thing that everybody talks about and it is very good at identifying who you are and serving you the content that you want. But the other thing is that TikTok makes it really easy to create really good content. And I think that that's missed a lot in these conversations. Um, it, you know, it, in, and it does it in two different ways. It, it provides the tools to create great content, you know, whether that's the green screen or the sound or, or any of the filters, et cetera. But it also provides inspiration because there's all these other ridiculously smart, creative people making really smart, creative stuff. And you watch what they're doing and you want to do them one better or you want to put your spin on their thing. And there's a culture on the platform that like, if you want to tell the same joke, but in a little bit of a different way, that's fine. Like do that. That like, that's what TikTok is about remixing. And, and so in that way, it really is about, and I think that the most rewarding thing on the app, certainly until the T creator fund was launched is the, the ability to just create. It feels really good and to reach audience and to have that moment in the, in the light because TikTok can, can take a chance on pretty much every piece of content that gets uploaded because you know the, it's so easy to move past a piece of content that you didn't actually like when you're in the experience of your For You, for you page. Um, and, uh, but yeah, like the, that, that inspiration is actually really a big deal. But I do think overall that it it kind of devalues the like the actual value of the of the view, whatever a view is, and it also I think overall devalues the the work of the creator just because there is an overabundance of supply. <laughs> yeah, well, is this a is this a platform where creators can actually build an audience and a community and build a life for themselves, like people have been able to do on YouTube and other platforms, or is it really just a place for anybody to come in and have some fun and make some content and then move on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that it's harder than on YouTube um, because the, the you know, a view matters less, a follow matters less than like a subscription, for example, on YouTube. You know, it's just, those are less valuable things. They're, they're lower barrier things. Um, but I think it is absolutely possible. I think it works best when it's done intentionally. And I think a lot of TikTok creators aren't really thinking about it right now. Like how do I, you know, make one video that's about getting lots of views and make another video that's about reinforcing my relationship with my audience and, and the fact that they matter to me and, and like that I care about that. And I think that it, like if you can do that back and forth a little bit, that, that really helps people feel like they're a part of what you're making so that when you launch some merch or you do a crowdfund or you ask them to go follow you on Instagram, they'll be more likely to, to do you a favor because they feel like you've been doing them a favor in a sense. Um, and I think that right now, a lot of TikTok creators are just sort of like caught in the, how do I make the number bigger mode, which is completely normal and how it usually happens in the, the first like six months of the creative life. And then you start thinking, okay, well, what am I actually gonna do with this? Oh There's a lot of people starting to have that have that thought, what am I gonna do with this now that I have it? Um, but I think that that is sort of just starting to happen. Well, and we are seeing a lot of uh, discord going on, particularly in the US between TikTok and the US government. And, and we're also starting to see some creators moving elsewhere. Charlie D'Amelio, mm -hmm. one of the biggest TikTokers, uh, and Addison Ray just announced that they're moving to Triller. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think's gonna happen? Can you separate TikTok from China? <laughs> I'd be put your put that no. uh, sort of hat on for me and tell me what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if I had to make a prediction, I'd say that uh, that Oracle has come in and give Don given Donald Trump an out. 
um, and that he will take it because 100 million people in America use TikTok. And if he turns it off right before the election, it'll be real bad for him. At the same time, uh, I think one of the major deadlines is actually after the election. So maybe that does confound that a bit, depending on how the election goes. And uh, but but my my sense is that you you can't turn this kind of app off when a third of the country is using it and liking it. You you kind of can't turn it off with that. Well, I think there's also a lot of legal considerations here. So I think if you ask if you ask for example, Apple and Google to take it off their app stores, I think probably you end up with a lawsuit instead of a, of compliance. Um, and so my guess is that uh, this is this was all um, you know a big story for for no real end, honestly. And I I very much doubt that TikTok is going anywhere in America. But I've been wrong about many things before. Yeah, we'll see where it goes. And it's anybody's guess. I guess the next deadline is in a couple of days. Is the twentieth of September. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, you're you are uh, one of the most amazing Renaissance men I have ever met. You're you are so good at so many things, and you have so many passions. Um, one of them is education, and I think we've seen COVID nineteen has really accelerated the pace of change for education. Something we thought would change much more rapidly, much more quickly. How do you see the world of education changing, and where do you see that going over the next few years? Well, I think that uh, it is almost inexcusable that it's taken us this long to to find ways to increase access to higher ed uh, specifically. Um, obviously, I think there's there's also a lot of work that needs to be done to provide content to make life easier for you know secondary school and primary school and and students and teachers. But I think the big the big work that needs to be done is in higher ed, which in America anyway is uh, you know it, it, almost in some cases like necessary for upward mobility in life, you know, not always, but often. And, um, and, but has just, has, has, while it has become less valuable because more people have been getting it. So there's a, a, you know, a demand, a supply and demand thing there as well. So it's becoming less valuable and becoming more costly. And we've been doing this for a long time, 40 years, it's been outpacing inflation and it's a little bit inexcusable. And I think that we need to take now as the moment where we say that's not going to happen anymore and we are going to use the tools that we have of which there are many to make college more accessible in two different ways one by making it cheaper two by making education better like by making it easier to learn stuff by creating tools that make it easier to learn instead of like relying on you know the the one and only way of teaching which is the lecture um, maybe with some some labs and stuff thrown on. I, I think this isn't a simple problem, but I think that, uh, well, I know that a lot of money is suddenly going into that space to try and uh, and figure out ways to to try and be a part of solving that problem, which I think we, we all should be a part of solving that problem right now because it's a big one and it matters a lot to the future of the world. Yeah, I mean, online video made it so that anybody could be a, an online video star and creator and didn't have to go to where the gatekeepers were in New York or LA or Sydney or whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. Seems like education going down the same path. I know we said in this session that we were going to have Q&A. We really don't have much time for Q&A. We've only got about a minute left. Uh, but I will say, first of all, uh, Destiny said that uh, she couldn't make it to VidCon in Anaheim because it was sold out the industry. We're going to bring it to Singapore, but you should come to Anaheim. I promise I'll have a ticket for you. <laughs> uh, and we had uh, NSG Music, who's a nerd fighter, part of your group, produced the Chameleon mm. Circus first album. Uh, oh, DFT yeah, yeah. Music label you produced. In in 30 seconds or less, what are your thoughts on the music space right now? Oh, God. Don't have, that's, <laughs> that's not fair. I think, uh, I think that we have no idea. I think that we have completely... Uh, like got, not gotten our minds around how TikTok is changing the intro or two and like all of these short form video apps is changing the music industry. And I know that there was some conversation about that earlier at, at this convention or, or conference, but boy, is it, it's a huge deal. And, uh, and I know that, that, that all of my music discovery is coming through TikTok right now. Um, and it's very good. Like it, it is effectively helping me discover really good stuff. So I uh, I think that we I think that the, the, the interface between music and video um, was not tight and now it is and uh, and and that's going to have some big impacts.
Cool. Well, we are out of time. Hank Green, amazing. So glad you're able to stop by. It's got a best-selling book out. Uh, it's a second novel. Uh, he's doing science education. He's got a music label. That's so much stuff. But um, most importantly, he is the the father of VidCon, and we are so happy to have him uh, be here. And I cannot wait to have VidCon come to Asia next year. Maybe a little bit this year. You know, Heck yeah. Know. 